to be continuing our series on the book of Luke. We're going to be focusing in on Luke chapter 2. But for those that missed the first session, I'd like to just uh, add a few reminders here for all of us. First of all, we know that uh, Luke wrote both the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And most likely, he was a Gentile, but also a convert to Judaism before he became a disciple. Why do we think that? Because he traveled with Paul in the second missionary journey, and Paul had Timothy get circumcised, but the, the Bible is really silent about Luke doing that, so he must have been already circumcised and thus able to go into the synagogues preaching the word with Paul. We find, of course, from the book of Colossians that he is a doctor, and of course, since he was with Paul, he was an evangelist. Amen? Amen. Most likely, uh, these books were written in about 60 to 62 AD while Luke was with Paul there in his imprisonment in Rome. And we, we date it right there fairly confidently because in the book of Acts, it does record the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, as well as the death of James, the first apostle that dies for the cause of Christ. And the book ends with Paul in prison. So with someone as significant as Paul, not to record his death, it must have been written beforehand. And we know that Luke was there until the bitter end. One of the most famous passages, in some ways one of the most lonely feeling passages, is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, when Paul, in about 66 A.D., simply writes to Timothy, Luke alone is with me. I mean, this guy was loyal to the end. Amen, guys? Amen. Now, one of the things that uh, Luke brings is the sense of vision for all of his readers that Jesus came to save the entire world, both Jew and Gentile. And so we have some repeated themes. One is joy. Another is money. Another is healing and salvation. You remember, of course, that the Greek word sozo has two different meanings. One is to heal and the other is to save. And, of course, we think the same way as the Greeks in that when someone is saved, we say, hey, their life has been healed. Their marriage has been healed. Their family has been healed. So we think the same way. Now, one of the things that I want to make sure that we remember, though, is the introduction. So let's go back to Luke chapter 1 and be reminded of how Luke wrote this incredible gospel inspired by the Spirit. It says in verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Of course, right here, we find that the letter itself, the gospel itself, is addressed to Theophilus just like the book of Acts is. Now, some have supposed that this is an a aristocratic Roman. I, I, I think not. It's just very simply the uh, method of address right here. Theo means God. Philo means friend. And so Luke is writing to, so to speak, all the friends of God. Amen. And since, of course, he's using a Greek name, we, we would have to suppose once more that he's trying to grab a hold of the Gentile audience. Now, the title of our lesson today as we get into chapter 2 is, Come, Let Us Adore Him. We're going to talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting right here in chapter 1, though, that the way that he composed this gospel was to go around and find all the eyewitnesses, the first-hand accounts of what went on. So that, quote, Theophilus, all these Gentiles, could be sure of the things that they would come to believe. Now, if you were going to write an account of the birth of Jesus, which eyewitness would you want to go to? Well, of course, common sense is Mary. 
Let's look at the internal evidences in chapter 2. That indeed, Luke talked to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Doesn't that send just a chill up your spine? Let's look at the internal evidence. First of all, we find right after the angels proclaimed throughout the heavens that Jesus is born, it says in verse 19, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, a second-hand account could say she did this or she said that. But only a first-hand account could really say, Hey, this is what I was pondering. In verse 33, after Jesus is brought as a child to the temple and he's brought before Simeon, the prophet, we find these words. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that would be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Once more, this is a direct talking to, to Mary. Well, now maybe Simeon understood that Joseph was not going to live to be able to see the physical ministry of Jesus. But on the other hand, this is a first-hand accounting of what Simeon said. And he said some strong words right here. And we find that both Joseph and Mary marveled at him, but he spoke to Mary that it would be her heart and her soul that would be pierced. And finally... After Jesus, uh, of course, uh, doesn't take off with Joseph and Mary when he's 12 years old to go back to Nazareth after being there for the feast of the Passover, of course, Joseph and Mary come back, and we'll read about it, uh, find Jesus. And uh, we read this in verse 48. When his parents saw Jesus, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Well, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was disobedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So we find right here that once more, she shares what she said to Jesus. And she seemed a little bit anxious right there. She didn't really understand all that was going on. But she treasured them in her heart. And I think a lot of us forget that there actually was a two-year imprisonment before the imprisonment in Rome. In Acts chapter 24, you remember, Paul was imprisoned under Felix. And it most likely was at this time when Luke was with him that he gathered a lot of the first-hand eyewitness account. And so we find that Mary is most likely alive by the end of the 50s, early 60s, A.D., that she indeed not only got to see the risen Christ, she not only got to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, she was there for the beginning of the church, Acts chapter 1, and she got to see the church evangelize the world in a generation. And so she shares all the early happenings that only Mary would have been able to have given the details about. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 2. Come on, Kip. Come on, Brian. The chapter is broken up very simply for us folks. It's broken very simply into three sections. Verses 1 to 20, I've entitled, The Adorned Newborn of Glory. Verses 21 through 40, the adored child of promise. And verses 41 to 52, the adored boy of mystery. Now you've got to admit, these are incredible events. But an event means nothing unless there is revelation and proclamation. And so we'll see within each one of these events, the birth of Jesus, taking him to the temple to be dedicated and finally, him going to the temple at age 12 at the Feast of the Passover. In each one of these events, there is a revelation by God that's a proclamation to the people. As a baby, of course, the instrument of revelation was the angel, which literally means messenger of God. 
When they went, of course, to dedicate Jesus to the temple, the revelation was through the prophets, Simeon and Anna. And finally, when he was a boy 12 years old and celebrating the feast of the Passover a little extra long, the revelation came through Jesus Christ himself. His first messianic words. Now, let's dig into the text. The date is 4 B.C. In verse 1, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Wow, you talk about seven packed verses of information. This is just overflowing right here. First of all, notice that Luke immediately gets into his theme. He says in the days of Caesar Augustus, the greatest and most powerful being on the face of the earth at that moment, a decree was issued that a census should be taken. Well, this census was for taxation purposes. But look what he says. A census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That is their worldview. He says, a census was to be taken of the whole world. So now we see our theme of Gentiles and Jew, the whole world. Next, it's broken on down in verse 3. And it says, and everyone went to his own hometown to register. Well, the everyone right here are the Jews. And God knew by moving in Caesar's heart for this census that the Jews would, would by custom go back to their hometowns and home territories in order for a census to take place. And so the Bible says very clearly right here, in verse 4, Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because it belonged to the house and the line of David. When I write here, he's, he's, he's saying a lot. First of all, we know that it's about 75 miles from Nazareth south to Jerusalem, and then about seven more miles south to Bethlehem. So that's quite a journey for a pregnant lady, amen? Might have been some encouragement to have it all happen right there, I don't know. But there are words right here that for the Jewish person reading this, it just hits their heart. The first thing right here, he talks about the fact that it was a town in Galilee that they had to go from in order to go to Judea. There has always been a promise for the descendants of Judah ever since the blessing of Jacob. Now go to Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis 49, this is when Jacob's about to die, and he, so to speak, blesses all of his 12 sons. Now, a lot of these are not the kind of blessings you'd want to get. But the one to Judah is pretty awesome. It's Genesis 49, beginning in verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O oh Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. There's the promise right there. Pretty awesome. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch, he will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. It's good to know Jesus had good teeth, huh? <laughs> well, right here, even in the prophecy, it compares him to a lion. And of course, that's one of the titles of Jesus in the book of Revelation, is the Lion of Judah. This was absolutely a messianic prophecy that the scepter 
the rule would never pass from Judah. And of course it goes down through David and down to Jesus. The second word that stands on out right here is Bethlehem. Turn to the book of Micah. In Micah chapter 5, another super well-known prophecy about the Messiah. Verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And so right here, Luke is writing to both Jew and Gentiles, and he's saying, hey, Jesus comes from the workings of God through the most powerful man of earth, moving through the entire Roman world, moving and using the customs of the Jews to bring him to the place of prophecy there in Bethlehem, Judah. Now, very interestingly, he shares in verse 5 very succinctly, Joseph went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So Luke kind of makes it clear, they're not married yet, so the baby is of a virgin. Verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Now, it doesn't say this is God's firstborn son. It's talking about Mary's firstborn son. Why? Because early on, there were even some false uh, ideas of the perpetual virginity of Mary. But we know from our previous study that, yes, Jesus was born of a virgin, but after that, Mary and Joseph had normal relations and many kids. Amen, guys? So he makes the point that it's her firstborn. And he simply adds, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Why? Because everybody was coming back to Bethlehem for the census and God wanted to show the humility of his coming Messiah by having him born not in a hotel, but in a barn. And the Bible says that he was placed in a manger. That's just simply the food trough right there. That's where Jesus was placed. You know, there's so much right there. But as incredible as as that event was, it, it would have meant nothing without the revelation about it. I mean, this is, it has to be, the second greatest event of all recorded history. The birth of Jesus. Well, what would be number one? The resurrection of Jesus. Amen, guys? But remember, with every great event, there must be revelation and then proclamation. And so now comes the revelation of God through God's angel. Look at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. At night. Now that, that's pretty amazing right there. You just get this scene right here. This very passive scene of these poor shepherds that don't even have something over their heads. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I mean, can you imagine you're just dozing out there in the field, and all of a sudden the lights come on in the middle of the night, and then there's this angel. Don't tell me you wouldn't be freaked out too. Look what he says right here. Verse 10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Well, there's the theme. Now, it goes over the head of the shepherds because the Jews were so arrogant in seeing themselves as being the people of God. They just thought all people meant them and only them. But, of course, we understand the thread that Luke is weaving through his writings that all people is Jews and Gentiles. Amen, church? And it's very interesting right here. For the first time in the book of Luke, we have the word that we get our English word evangelism from. The angel says, I bring you good news. That's what evangelism means. Bringing good news. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Well, right here, there are three titles for Jesus. Savior, Christ, and Lord. Of course, Savior means saving or healer. Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. And for the first time applied to Jesus, Lord, Master of the universe. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, 
and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I mean, isn't this incredible right here? I mean, these shepherds had been evangelized. The angel had brought good news. And now once they had seen the baby Jesus... Once they'd seen Joseph and Mary, and it was exactly as they had been told by the angel. They just couldn't keep it to themselves. The Bible says right here that they started spreading the word. Are you with me right there? You know, in the bulletin today are a lot of neat pictures. But the one that uh, I thought was just fascinating is is this picture of our, our new sister Ashley on page three right there. I mean, you look at a young lady that's pumped. I mean, she is just fired up to be baptized there in the ocean. And you're looking at her best friend, Michaela's right there. And, of course, then we have Paula right there. And, and then Casey. We don't know what Casey is doing, but she's fired up. <laughs> now, you know, many of us remember just really a few short weeks ago, Michaela was the one that was getting baptized. She's up here just pouring her heart out. She's just saying, I, you know, I just feel bad before the Lord, but I'm so, so thankful for His grace. And then at the end, she did something I hadn't ever seen done before. She had two of her best friends in the crowd. She calls them out by name. And she says, I refuse to let you two be lost. I go, that's bold. (laughs) That's calling them out right there. (laughs) Ashley was one of those two young ladies. And Michaela was faithful to her vow. You see, when you get evangelized, when it really is good news, you're going to want to spread the news. How about it? Have you called out your friends? Have you called out your family and said, listen, I refuse to let you be lost. Now, you know, when I talked to uh, Ashley and her other friend afterwards, they were not the most interested in Lord two women I'd ever met. (laughs) And you know how it's uncomfortable when you get called out in an assembly of thousands or something? I'm sure they felt a little uncomfortable. You know, there's nothing comfortable about evangelism. You know, a lot of people, they want to be cool Christians. That, that, you cannot be. If you want to be cool, you can't be a Christian. But you know, I've got to ask you. Are you like the shepherds? Are you like Michaela? Who just says, listen. I refuse to let you be lost. You're my friends. I refuse to let you be lost. You're my family. And you don't care about the uncomfortability it causes because you know that the end is more than worth it. Is there salvation? You know, this past week, Elena and I were in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And it was an extraordinary time. We had a, a gathering of disciples. There, of course, was Jose Antonio and his wife, Laura Morales, there in Guatemala City. We had a group of 12 come uh, from El Salvador, from San Salvador, an incredible couple, uh, Roberto and Marlene Jovell. And uh, then, extraordinarily, about eight hours away through the mountains, we had a group of 25 come from San Pedro Sula, Honduras, you know, led by Dorian and Rosa Bonilla. And this group, I mean to tell you, they, they were as fired up. I, I said, I got to ratchet it up right here, you know. <laughs> I mean, they were just so fired up to come help another group of disciples start a new church. But it was very extraordinary. Quickly, one sister stood out. A very beautiful, striking young lady. 
And she came on up and she says, I just want to thank you for taking a stand for God. And she started crying. But what really got me is I, I, I noticed very quickly that, that she'd lost one of her arms right just below the shoulder. And I asked her, um, Marta, how did, how did that happen? She says, well, you know, a few years ago, I was baptized and I got saved. And I was so fired up. And then after a few years, my heart drifted from God. And I fell away from God and the church. And I just threw myself into the world. I, I, I was going to the Cayman Islands. I was making lots of money. I was traveling. I mean, I was living what I thought was this dream life. And then I came back last December to visit my family in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. And I was on a head-on car crash. And I immediately had my arms severed. When I woke up, all I could think about was God. And this woman, Rosa. Because this woman, Rosa, had studied with me. And I just wished she'd somehow come back. After a few days in the hospital, she's out in the streets. And lo and behold, getting out of a taxi is Rosa Bonilla. Marta runs on over to her. I've been praying that, that God would send you. And of course they talked, they shared, they studied in a few days, and she was restored. The thing that... The, the thing that is so amazing is that th there's just not one sense of resentment or bitterness about this beautiful, gorgeous woman losing her arm. She goes, I am just so thankful that God had such mercy. Now, I know God was coming after me. You, you know how it is when God comes after you? Shh. At first, you want to write it off to Satan, but you go, no, it's God. <laughs> God is coming after you. And she says, I knew it was God. And I was just so grateful that he spared my life. At, at the end, she's just crying. And it seemed like every time I, I turned around, she was talking to people. She was reaching out to people. And I asked Rosa about her. I, she said, this woman evangelizes everyone she meets. She's just so grateful. Let me ask you, how grateful are you? Or is God coming after you and you thought it was Satan? How about it? Have some of you left the Lord? And God is coming after you? You heard the testimony of the restorations here earlier. I mean, they were powerful. These people have turned back to God even in all their wickedness. And God, in his mercy, has accepted every one of them back and the church has accepted everyone back. Amen, guys? But you know, we need to understand, I mean, God loves us so much that he will take us within a breath of life in order to have our soul for eternity. How about it? Are we spreading the good news like those shepherds? I mean, with, with the Women's Day coming up, are you fired up about the Women's Day? How about it, guys? Are we out there fired up about the Women's Day? Inviting moms and sisters and those girls that are pretty attractive there at the office? No, we've got we've to get a deep conviction to spread the good news. Our second point is the adored child of promise. In verse 21, we read this. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, and the name the angel had given him before he'd been conceived. Now right here, all that Luke the writer is really saying says, well, his name is Jesus, which means the Lord is salvation. So there's our theme again. But also, he's trying to point out how pious and obedient Joseph and Mary are. Different than Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Says when they were told what they were supposed to name Jesus, that's what they named him. 
They were obedient to God. Amen, guys? Now, here's the really cool part. Verse 22. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. You know, right here is the taking of Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to God. And in order to understand this passage, we're going to have to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus. Go back to Leviticus chapter 12. Now, I don't know how many of you guys are having quiet times there right now. But this is an incredible book. Some people just blow through it. I mean, it's so insightful. And you're going to get an insight right now that only by going back and studying in the book of Leviticus would you really be able to understand the New Testament there, particularly in the offering of only two birds as a sacrifice. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Well, that's exactly what happened with Jesus. On the eighth day, he was circumcised. He was brought into covenant, so to speak. And at that point, he is given the name, like all Jewish boys, a name, and his name was Jesus. Verse 4. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. So in other words, 40 days after birth, she must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If she gives birth to a daughter for two weeks, the woman will be unclean as during her period. Then she must wait 66 days to be purified from her bleeding. When the days of her purification for her son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for women who give birth to a boy or a girl. If she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she will be clean. So now going back to our text right here, we find that Mary had shared, hey, we didn't have enough money for a lamb, and so we had to offer two birds. We had to offer one as a burnt offering, and one as a sin offering. Amen? Well, now let's look what happens. This is, this is amazing. Verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was a righteous and devout man. Let's just stop right there. You know, uh, Simeon could be pronounced Shimeon, or in other ways. I, I still remember when I was a young preacher, I was at my first gig, so to speak, there in Philadelphia. <laughs> And I was all fired up, and, and I, I was trying to teach on Wednesday night uh, about David, in the book of 1 Samuel. And I got up there, and I was just talking about how the enemies of God were the Philistines. And I had this lady come on up, and she goes, Young man, I cannot believe your abominable pronunciation. It's not Philistine, it's Philistine. Oh, sorry, sis. Well, later on, I learned that in, in Hebrew, there are no vowels. So, you can't say how something is pronounced. <laughs> so, if you slaughter a word, somebody's name in the Bible, you're good to go pretty much. <laughs> so, let's get back to our text right here. And let's talk about Simeon or Shimeon or whoever you'd like to call him, Simon. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Oh, what happened? Did they lose or something? Or no, 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 no. Right here, consolation means the deliverance for Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. Is that incredible? Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. There's world evangelism, amen, guys? Amen. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I mean, if you're a mom, you remember being in the temple. You're about to go sacrifice these two birds and this old guy just comes and takes the baby out of your arms. Didn't say he asked. <laughs> and then he starts prophesying to the Holy Spirit. He says, now God, sovereign God, I can die in peace because I've seen the Messiah. Now how powerful is this moment? Think about it. With David, Samuel didn't know which son was supposed to be the anointed. But here it's been revealed to this old prophet exactly who it is. You say, it's that one right there. Can you imagine the beating of his heart? Can you imagine Mary's heart when the baby gets taken away right there? Yeah. I mean, she remembered that moment. And he says, now I can die in peace. And he understood something. That this would be salvation for all people. And he's quite clear. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to the people Israel. And Joseph and Mary just marvel and go, wow. That's incredible. And then he says to Mary, Mary, your child is going to be the cause of the fall and rise of many. And he will be a sign that will be spoken against. And it's going to pierce your soul. You're a young mom with a 40-day-old kid. This old guy, you never forget. Well, what else happens? Verse 36. There was also a prophetess. Amen. Well, now this is incredible. Actually, God's worldview is that the whole world can be summed up as Jew and Gentile, but also male and female. So now we have the old male prophet, Simeon. And then we have the prophetess, Anna. Now to get a perspective before we get into it, you need to know that this time... There was a strong tradition amongst the Jews there were, that there were but seven prophetesses in the Old Testament. Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Miriam, the sister of Moses. Deborah, the judge of Israel. Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the numbskull, but David. <laughs> Huldah, the prophetess that helped out Josiah during the incredible re restoration, and Esther. So when Luke writes, here is a prophetess, it's with this background. I mean, that's, that's incredible company, amen? Wow. Yeah. Now look at this. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, or perhaps better pronounced Peniel, of the tribe of Asher. Well, that's kind of interesting because all these, the ten tribes have been dispersed and yet there were just a few from each of the ten tribes that still kept their lineage clean. And so we're talking about a rare, a very rare, pure Jew from the tribe of Asher. She was very old and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. You know, most Hebrew women at that time married about 14 or 15 years old. 
The Bible says she is married for seven years and then her husband dies. Now in the midst of that, she doesn't get depressed. She doesn't get bitter. She doesn't get down. She just totally devotes herself to the worship and praise of God until this moment when she's 84 years old. How special was she? It says she never left the temple, so they even had a little room for her there in the temple. Everybody knew Anna, the prophetess. And then she sees him, and then she just breaks out in thanks to God. And then she begins to preach. I mean, anybody that sees Jesus starts spreading the news. You see, right here, the revelation was that Jesus is being dedicated to God. How was it revealed? To the two prophets, Simeon and Anna. A special note, I think, in my mind is Simeon. Because he had been uniquely promised that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And when he sees him and when he's holding that little baby, he goes, now I can die in peace. How many people want to die in peace? You know, I'm, I'm really moved by the incredible things that have been happening in our sister church in Phoenix. About two and a half years ago, Chris and Sonia Klopak said, listen, it's time we got to start again, and we're just going to start a new church. Just the two of us. Now, that takes guts. Now, two and a half years later, there are 50 disciples in that church. Is that awesome? They have 120 every Sunday. God is moving in incredible ways. Well, one of the first people that got baptized was Chris's dad, Neil. Now, he's a doctor. And, of course, if he's the dad of Chris, he's an old guy. <laughs> And a couple of weeks ago, he found out that one of his old buddies, Bill Secor, 70 years old, was in the hospital dying of cancer. He immediately goes and visits his friends. He starts to talk to them. And, and, and you got to go know Neil. Neil, I mean, he, he talks very slowly, but extremely deliberately. It would be impossible. Possible to misunderstand him. <laughs> and I guess his words to Bill were something to the effect, you know, you need a relationship with God or you're going to go to hell. Jeez. Now, you know that? That can have impact. <laughs> he says, would you like to study the Bible? Now, you got to understand, Bill had no religious background, didn't believe in Jesus. He starts studying. They all, different brothers come from the church. I mean, it's incredible. So many people are visiting, trying to encourage Bill to rally his health. I mean, he's down to under 100 pounds at this point. Finally, he comes to the light and darkness where you've got to confess your sin. And he just lays it out. And then he turns to one of the brothers. And he says, bro, I, I've got to especially apologize to you. When you and your wife first came to visit, I lusted after your wife. Oh, that's a little uncomfortable right there. You know, a lot of us wonder about deathbed conversions. Let me tell you something. This guy was getting ready to meet Jesus right here. He wasn't going to leave anything out. How about it? Are we that open? Are we that honest? Come on, Kev. Preach Well, the amazing thing is, is that they knew his time was short. He says, I'm ready to go. But they knew that the hospital had some policies. And so it was in time to invoke the scripture, we must obey God rather than men. So the brothers quickly went out and got the horse trough. We baptize people in horse troughs around here. And they, if you can sneak a horse trough into the hospital, <laughs> they snuck the horse trough into, into the elevator, you know, carried it down the hall. And actually, they had a little help from the staff and everything, because they made the water real warm and everything. But they baptized him. Four days later, our brother Bill died in peace. 
and went to heaven. Amen. How about it? How's your soul? Is there peace in your soul? Are you right with your God? Some of you have been studying the Bible for a real long time. And you're not serious. Say, why are you saying I'm not serious? Because you haven't made a decision. Some of you are wondering, well, should I be restored? Should I be restored? What about this church? That church? Listen, this isn't about churches. This is about God. You've not fallen away from a church. You've fallen away from the living God. That's why your life is hell. Come on, talk about it. And some of us, even as disciples, it's been a while since we've gotten gut level open about our sin. This guy, Bill, he knew he was going to meet Jesus. And he's in peace with Jesus now. When a disciple's not at peace, then you know something is wrong. We're not talking about circumstances. Because see, you can, you can have peace in the midst of, of all circumstances. Remember, Jesus was asleep in the boat in the middle of a storm. He just gets up and says, peace be still, and there's the storm's over. <laughs> the issue is, do you have peace in your soul? Are you right with your God? As the primary, fundamental thing that gives you peace in your heart. Our final point, we'll need to move quickly, is the adored boy of mystery. Twelve years pass, and verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was twelve years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him amongst relatives and friends. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem and looked for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Well, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in a favor with God and men. You know, every year the Bible points out they made sure that Jesus made it too. The Passover feast. Once more showing their righteousness. And for a boy 12 in that particular day, uh, the equivalent might be today a boy 16 or 18. Is the way we handle things. And uh, so it really wasn't an unusual thing to think that after seven days, they stayed for the whole duration of the feast, it was just time to go home. And they had such a large caravan come on down from Nazareth, they just figured Jesus was with all the Uh, young friends that he had. So they go a day's journey. Now you remember, it's 75 miles. So they go one day's journey. So that's one day. They go, "Uh uh-oh, Jesus isn't here. (laughs) Then they got to go back. That's two days. And then they look for him and find him on the third day, foreshadowing his resurrection. Amen, guys? Now when they find him, I think it's quite interesting that he's there at the temple listening to the teachers and learning from them. This is the Son of God. And we see right here a humbleness and a desire to learn. And then his mom is is frankly very anxious and ticked off. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Now, you got to remember, Jesus is perfect. I mean, this is the first time in her mind he's messed up. And Jesus, you know, just cool, calm, and collected. Different than us husbands, you know, when the wife kind of gets on us. Oh. oh, Mom, why were you searching for me? Didn't you 
know I had to be in my father's house? Or another way to translate it. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And of course, Luke was talking to Mary, and it simply says, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. When they had gone to the temple 12 years before to dedicate Jesus to God, they had no idea how dedicated he would be to God. Wow. Wow. And right here, he makes it clear about his sense of priority and his sense of mission. He says, Mom, didn't you know? Expecting a positive answer. Did, didn't you know? I had to be in my, my father's house. I mean, this is radical in the mindset of a Jew in that day. The idea of an intimate relationship with God as father. And it was so deep, so spiritual, that even Mary and Joseph didn't understand. But Luke is quick to write. Then Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. In other words, this act of disobedience was an isolated incident because he was the perfect child. Don't you wish your kid was like that? <laughs> But seriously, Luke makes it clear. Jesus was obedient. Except in his case, when he had to put his spiritual father over his earthly family. You know, one of the things that stands out is Jesus' relationship with God. The intimacy, the humbleness, the learning. And you know, when, when I was down there in, in Guatemala, it, it was really good for me. I mean, it's, it's amazing how in America you can get so unspiritual. Yep. I go on down there, and uh, bless their hearts, they, they got in a hotel that certainly we could afford, but all the very poor brothers and sisters in Honduras and El Salvador could afford. That's a challenging hotel. <laughs> I walk in, I go, Elena, it's no air conditioning. Then, I panicked. I said, babe, there's no hair dryer. I mean, these are serious concerns. I mean, I was down there to preach the gospel. I was, I was down there to teach the people how to live like Jesus. Seriously. I mean... I just, I had to take a step back and go, man, how far I am from what Jesus was really like and what he was like in his early days. You know, I, I, I wish I could just take all you guys, and just put you on an airplane, take you on down there to Honduras or Guatemala City or El Salvador and, and let you see the joy that's in these disciples that from your point of view have nothing going on good in their life. You know, I wonder, is it really worth all those extra hours that you work to provide all the good things for your family? Where you disconnect with your wife and your kids? Is it really worth all the money you spend on your precious nails? Your wrinkly face? Your graying hair? I mean, guys, our, our lives are consumed with worldly things. And yet the only thing that counts in this world is an intimate relationship with God. And sometimes it takes going to a very poor country with very poor disciples for you to remember, yes, that's what I believe. That's what I'm all about. That's my Jesus. And that's my brothers and sisters. And that's what we need to be in Guatemala City. But that's what we need to be here in Los Angeles. 
if we're really going to be God's church. Amen. You know, it was exciting to be down there. At our first inaugural service there for the Guatemala City International Christian Church, we had 80 in attendance. I mean, it was incredible. Not only did we start a new church in Guatemala City, but we also started a new church in San Salvador, El Salvador. And of course, I don't know if you know, but uh, Carlos Mejia is from El Salvador. He was born there. And I just, I just happened to have a, a, a few bulletins with me. And uh, I, I took him on out. I was showing Roberto, who's from El Salvador. He says, I know him. I said, you know Carlos? He says, yeah. I heard him speak five years ago, and he was awesome. Do, 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 do you think he could come down and speak at our inaugural service in El Salvador? I said, well, I don't know, but I got a hunch he'll go. <laughs> Carlos talked to Roberto yesterday, and he's going down in April to speak for their inaugural service. Are you with me there? You know, it's, it, it's incredible, guys. Just get, you think of what's happening. I hope, I hope you just take a moment just to, just to stand back and ponder the moment, even if you don't understand like Mary. I mean, last week, three people were baptized into Christ. One was restored. This week, six are being baptized in Christ. Three more are being restored. You are seeing the multiplication of disciples. You're not only seeing the multiplication of disciples. You are seeing the multiplication of churches. You're not just seeing the multiplication of churches. You are seeing the very fulfillment of the word of God spoken and promised for generation that the light of Jesus would shine upon all Gentiles bringing glory to Israel thank you and God bless